because we did a lean coffee yesterday or a Deming coffee yesterday, so he's not going to need a lot of introduction, but I did want to say that I had the pleasure of meeting him shortly after coming to the W. Edwards Deming Institute, and actually uh, we've had a couple times to go out to dinner, and we've met in airports and things like that, and uh, I've uh, found him and his partner, Tony Ann, to be great people, and I really believe in what they're doing. And on that second or third day that I was with the, the Deming Institute, I ended up going to one of their personal Kanbans, which he had a chance to talk about uh, yesterday a little bit. And it really opened my eyes to a lot of what he's about and a lot of uh, what we can do and, and how we can change uh, people's ways of thinking. And I, I found it uh, very moving and a really rewarding experience. And yesterday I was so excited to see how the Lean Coffees, uh, everybody, you know, we hardly had any attrition. The tables were packed and people were conversing and people were, you know, making up meeting agendas. And that's what it's really all about. And that's what I've, uh, you know, really found uh, rewarding in Jim's work. Um, he's written a couple books about that, him and Tony Ann both, but uh, I did, it was my pleasure to introduce him. And so I'm gonna let him get started. But Jim, thank you and uh, off you go. Hello, wide and dispersed audience. <laughs> Maintaining eye contact with the audience will be pretty much, I'll be a pivot sprinkler of words here. Just, Rainbow. you know. So uh, I'm Jim Benson. I look like that when my hair's cut. I look like this when I have traveled too much. Uh, very quickly about me, uh, I got my start as a civil engineer, and so I built very big things, so I built that thing. <laughs> Uh, I built the Seattle light rail system, light rail in Tel Aviv and some other cities around the world, uh, large cities, things with multi-billion dollar price tags. Um, one day I got very annoyed with my government clients and I started a software company uh, specifically designed to make software for government to make them better stewards of their data and more collaborative. <laughs> and uh, while that sounds kind of Dante Quixote X, uh, we actually did quite a, quite a good job with it. Um, and we specialized in rescue missions. So other people would take on projects for the government. They blow the budget, they blow the deadline, and with about 10% of both, we would usually come in, redesign everything, and execute it because we had the gall and the audacity to build software with five or six people instead of 150. And oddly enough, less complexity meant more completion. So at one point, we became frustrated with how software was developed, and a lot of you got to listen to Prani talk earlier today about how awesome it is to be in the software world. And they use something that's called Agile methodologies, and Agile is to software development as Six Sigma is to business. It's bloated and kind of a pain in the butt and mistaken for freedom. Uh, and so what we do is we build very tiny, thin systems on a kind of more Deming model to help people do things. And that's structurally who I am, but in real life I actually like to eat and I read a lot. And I, with Tony and I travel all over the place and our major goal in life is that uh, we want to help people become happy so that they will build better products because we fundamentally believe that happy people do, do exactly that. So I'm going to veer wildly between theory and practice because that's what I like to do. So we're gonna start off here with some pretty heavy theory. Uh, and this guy, uh, Gilbert Ryle here, he was a uh, British philosopher. You can tell because he's got the pipe. Um, and one of his quotes, his big quotes, is that man need not be degraded to a machine by being denied the right to be a ghost in the machine. So when we're working, we are part of and simultaneously the process that we are working in. So when SOPK goes through and it says, you know, psychology is part of any process, that means that we're part of the process. And people think, no, 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 we have a set process and then we have some people. It's like, yeah, we'll fire half your people, bring half new people in, see if your process stays the same. It won't, it will change. So it's, symbi it's a symbiotic relationship. So he said that, uh, the blue suit guy here, said basically that we need to be focused on why we're working, why we're doing the job. It's, uh, what we're doing is incidental. What we're, why we're doing it is incredibly important. 
So in our minds, and Tony Ann's and I my, my, minds, there's only one successful way, or one way to do a successful project or release a successful product, and that's actually to pay attention to it. So when people ask us, you know, what is lean? We say lean isn't tools, lean isn't practices, lean isn't any of the crap that you buy books about. Lean is simply about paying attention. Uh, that's very much a Deming message that we are gluing to lean because lean is the one that gets the benefit of the buzzword that actually gets us clients. Um, so we all talk a lot about SOPK. And it's like SOPK this, SOPK that. Uh, I just named my kid SOPK. Uh, everything is SOPK. Well, what is it really? So we, we know that it looks like this, and it's kind of a set of components. I'll get kind of closer to it here, because everybody likes to get closer to it. It's really big here, right? Um, but you know, we have that systems are natural, systems are nested, we are all parts of systems. We kind of get that. We get that with variation, that the systems lack inherent predictability and that we would like to understand the nature of that lack of predictability. When we do that, we learn, so we get our knowledge, and then in the end, all of that stuff ends up beating us over the head repeatedly, or we beat it over the head repeatedly, so we are again impacted by the systems that we're in, and we impact them, so they is us. Systems is made of people. So, ah, oh, you can't see it. There's a beautiful, grayed out image of uh, Deming here that's like gorgeous on a real monitor. Uh, but anyway, so there's a little grayed out Deming there, but basically what Deming was telling us was that when we actually understand our work, then we can improve it. And not only that, but when we understand our work and we're given the ability to improve it, we will. We don't have to be told to. We just do it. And so that's a, it's a fundamental human action to improve the environment that's around you. It is alien to us to allow ourselves to live in substandard conditions. So people that are working aren't doing that naturally, and why not? Well, at the moment they need some reassurance. Years of top-down Taylorist style management has given us a bit of learned helplessness. We've tried to help in the past, we've been kicked in the head, we said, oh, I'm not gonna do that again. So people need some reassurance, first off, that their work isn't in vain. So they go to work, they do something, does it get like a lot of my work as an urban planner was tossed in a drawer somewhere and I was supposed to be happy because I got a check for it? So I spent literally months of my life on an environmental impact statement that no one would ever look at. Um, we had a project, um, actually it was the one from the picture, the software picture, where we built an entire website under extreme duress, and we get to the end and we're like, yes, we finished, this is so awesome, and it got up and it ran perfectly and everybody was happy, and then they came back and they said, we're not going to pay you. I said, why not? They said, because you never wrote a detailed design document. I was like, but it's done. Uh, and they said, yeah, and you love it, yeah. Well, the thing here said you didn't check off detailed design document. Okay, so write one. Now? Yeah, but, but it's done. Why? It's, no, no, I've got a checkbox. Empty, no check. Put, we need put check in box. So we said, well, can we write you a user manual? No. Can we write you an operations manual? No. Can we write you a future revisions requirement document? No. So we had to go back and write a plan for something that was already done and spend $30,000 of public money just, just to satisfy that requirement. That work was in vain. And it made me stand up here and complain about it for two minutes of my 50. Um, so we want people, people want to be reassured also that they can act within reason. So when they see that something can be improved, either they can improve it or they can go through some known process to improve it, but that they have the ability when they see that there's a rest reason to act that they can do so. And if they don't get that reassurance, they won't act because they have fear. So Deming said drive out fear. Well, in knowledge work and especially in the software industry, we have successfully driven out fear. We've replaced it with terror. <laughs> so um, we have 
a reassurance now that we are not working in vain, that we can act within reason, and now we want a reassurance that management will ask consistently. Because Tony Ann and I will go into places and things will be getting better, but people still won't be getting happier. And we'll say, why not? And they said, yeah, two years ago things got better. Then they sucked again. And then they got better again. And then they sucked again. Because management comes and goes, and with them comes different people who are more or less amenable to actually managing, right? So we have systems. And especially in knowledge work, which is what we work, Tony and I work mostly in, all systems are emergent systems. The products are emergent products. So it's not like we have an assembly line that is kicking out the same gear or the same sprocket over and over again. It's somebody has an idea that they think might work, and then we come up with a plan and then we give it to somebody and then we make them build it and then we blame them when our plan was wrong. That's, that's how almost all of knowledge work works. So we're in an emergent system and people in that system more or less understand that the system is emergent but they don't know what to do with it. So they don't actually understand the system itself. So um, I, just a few moments ago, was chatting with Gordon, we were saying, you know, people already have seen millions of case studies uh, saying Deming stuff works, lean stuff works, being nice to people works. You, you should try it sometimes. People are like, yeah, it worked for you, but we're a pretty nasty company, you know. And, um, we, we, like, we like it when the, tur when, the, when the key gets stuck and the teenagers run into trees, you know, and we don't want to fix that. Um, so there are definite cultural issues that make people actively turn a blind eye to, to their systems. So we, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, well, we understand that we understand the nature of building software or building cars. Now we actually want to put a little bit of energy into understanding the system, the system itself. There it goes. Is that next? Yeah, it's next. So that guy said that thing, and everybody knows it. Um, but it's one of my favorite quotes because people have taken that to launch. This, this is the quote that has launched a thousand ships and unfortunately most of them have been destroyers, right? Uh, so this is, this is like lesson number one that the Lean Six Sigma people will run around and go, we're Deming-esque because we know everything's a system and we're going to subject you all to it. Um, so the, this, this word is a funny word because we think that systems mean surety and preciseness, but actually a system could mean a whole lot of unknowns, just that you understand the nature of those unknowns. And once you do understand the nature of those unknowns, then you really know what you're doing. So the moment that you know what you, pre what you perennially do not know, that's the moment when you can actually start to act and build some real real interesting things. So we need to be understand and be comfortable with the nature of ambiguity in business. If we didn't have ambiguity in business, we wouldn't make money. The value add is that guessing correctly or dealing correctly with ambiguity, being able to deal correctly with changes in the market, being able to deal quickly with those things. So. We're in systems and we react to them. Um, okay, your job right now is to cross the street. Um, like that guy, right there. He's crossing the street. Uh, this is outside my hotel when I was living in Hanoi. Uh, there is actually a crosswalk here. There's a crosswalk here and the traffic always looks like this. This is not the phase of a, life, a light cycle because there are no traffic lights, right? It is one constant movement and you can see that there are people here going this way, there are people here going this way, there are actually people coming through this way, there's people coming over going this way, people going that way, people coming from all directions. Okay, this is how you walk across the street in Vietnam. Yeah, you don't look at anybody, 
You don't stop, you don't pause, you don't do anything weird, you join this emergent system, and all of these people are hyper aware of where they are and what they're doing. Because if they're not, they're gonna run into something. Okay? All of these people right now are incredibly knowledgeable about their role in this system. And when you enter it as walker, you walk across. It's kind of like uh, R2 and 3PO in the beginning of Star Wars, where there's like a little phaser fire flying around and they just walk right through. Uh, but, but I did that several times a day, every day. Only got ran into once. Um, and it, uh, well, the way I wrote about it is it's kind of like being run into a shopping cart at Walmart on Black, Thur or Black Friday, right? It's, um, it's a low impact collision, it kind of freaks you out, but, but then you're done. Uh, so this is a real system, and our job is to cross the street, and there is a way to do it. And initially what we see when we look at this, when we're used to traffic lights, is we see chaos. What we want to see is something that looks like this. Something nice and reassuring and comfortable and you know everything's going to be filed away because everything is exactly where it belongs. Right? So and so I, I need the, something between the craw and the qua and I can just pluck it right out there until the one day when I go there and it's not and the whole world falls apart. Because everything here is so rigidly defined that any exception is going to break the system. So this is actually a better system because I know that I have to look for whatever I have to go for and it's, it's in here somewhere underneath the Coke can or, or what have you. So in knowledge work, when we try to over apply standard work or process, we will create something that looks like this and it will be worse than having nothing at all. Uh, how many people here have ever been subjected to a, um, like an SAP rollout or some sort of large ERP implementation. It, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, so all the people that, that raised their hands, if you didn't raise their hand when we leave, I want you to walk up to those people and say, thank you for your service. <laughs> okay, uh, they, they, have, they have been through the business equivalent of NOM, okay? Um, so, what happens when you, uh, when, you, uh, when you build an ERP is you are trying to change literally every element of a company with software at the same time. So, whereas um, uh, Gordon mentioned that that's completely the antithesis of what they did, there's a reason for that. <laughs> it's because they're un unusually intelligent. Um, so, we want to build systems and those systems are going to build our products and this is all going to come from evolving experiments that we don't know the results of and stories that we don't know the ending of. We come up with a hypothesis in the beginning and we refine that process until the day that we decide to actually release the thing, right? And even then, you've all used version 2.0 of any software, you're still learning. So you've actually given somebody something and taken money from them, and you have no intentions of ever helping them again, but you're watching what they're doing out of the corner of your eye, or hopefully somebody is, or maybe they're just sending their lawyers after you, and then later you type up a, uh, a, a 2.0 version. Uh, once we acknowledge software acknowledges or anybody else acknowledges that we don't know what the results are going to be when we release something, then we can start to get into some real interesting process. And we'll talk about that. So here's a, here's a couple of quick stories. Um, so any project is a story. I know some people, they're hurting in some way, I'm gonna build a thing and then their lives will be better because of my thing. Uh, and if you can't tell your business as that kind of a story, then you're either telling the story of there's some people with some money that I'm going to steal, or there's some time of my own that I'm wasting. <laughs> that, those, those are like the three stories that are possible. So this first story that we're gonna talk about is entitled Embracing Variation. Uh, to, to, 
I just now realize that this kind of makes me feel like I'm at the beginning of a Bullwinkle episode. <laughs> um, but uh, so, um, wait, I'm going to talk about that before I show you silly pictures. So the Library Corporation is a 35-year-old software firm. They are located in Inwood, West Virginia, and they make software that governs or manages most of the libraries in the world. Um, there is nothing not ironic about any section of that entire statement. <laughs> so a 35-year-old software firm, really? You lived that long in West Virginia. Uh, what? Uh, and they make it for libraries. What? Yeah, so we were pretty surprised all the way around when we, we started working with them. And uh, our first task with them was to help them with uh, problems that they were having in their sub customer support department. And the managers had told us all of these things about, oh, you know, they're, they're not the best people, you know, you should, you know, it's, it's we'll do the best we can. And uh, so we arrive, and these people are angry, um, like, like that angry. Uh, and they are literally this angry for two reasons. One is they're coming to work every day, and they're vandalizing the building. They're kicking holes in the walls. They're punching their monitors. They're breaking their desks. Like, maybe not every day, but enough. <laughs> um, and they have a ticketing system, and that ticketing system has 2,000 tickets in it. So they have a backlog of 2,000 tickets. Every day they go to work, and it's like this frozen tidal wave over their heads of tickets. And they come in and they go, I am lousy at my job because the metric that I'm seeing is so oppressive. The group was doing about 250 tickets a day, but they were bringing in 250 tickets a day. So if anybody sneezed or went to the bathroom or got sick, it added to the backlog. Now, these people are governed by something that's called a net promoter score. And the net promoter score is based on one metric, which is would you recommend this service to a friend? One to 100 scale, their ranking was 95. Comcast would literally hire people to kill other people to get a net promoter score of more than 60. <laughs> uh, these guys were amazing at their job. They had uh, 24 people. They were supporting 60 products. They were getting calls from things from ancient vaxes all the way to, to modern equipment. They were doing incredible work. And they went to work every day angry because of this metric. Um, now, the picture that I've shown here, which you, I don't know if you can tell exactly, but it's of uh, um, one woman in a cage fighting uh, scenario beating the crap out of some guy. Um, and the reason that that's up there was uh, the two natural leaders of this group were actually cage fighters. They were awesome at their jobs, and they left for a couple of years to become professional cage fighters, and then they came back again. Um, it was, it, we, were, we were really in, in West Virginia. Um, <laughs> but they wanted, they wanted this change. And they, when we came in, they let us know how angry they were, right? So the first thing that they did, of course, was they said, well, since we've got this huge backlog, we should have an award for whoever does the most tickets every day, which of course gets the stern, angry look. This is the stern, angry Deming picture that we have here. It's like, really? Yeah, really? It's like, for 50 damn years I've been saying, really? Uh, you know, I couldn't find the Deming banging his head on the, de on the desk picture. I, I looked really hard. I actually called. Uh, I, I, Kevin and, and Judy and said, you know, I would like pictures of, of Deming, like either really angry or riding a BMX bike, you know, one of the two, just, but they, 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 gave, they sent me more pictures that looked like this. <laughs> uh, but um, so, so they had their unknown var uh, variation and then they had to, they tried to legislate it away, which is what most of our society does with problems. They're like, oh, are you bothering me? Well, I'm going to make bothering me illegal. No. 
own father me. There, under penalty of torture, you know. Uh, so when they put up the, those, um, uh, when they gave the award, almost immediately what was left of the fragile environment that these people were working in completely broke down. So every day somebody would win the award and everybody else would say, you cherry picked all the easy tickets, I took the hard tickets, I'm the real worker here, you suck. And, uh, you know, then it just, and then they started to lose people and lost like some very, very good long-term employees. So um, what we did, so, now, Tony and I have a mantra, mantra and it's that we only ask people to do two things. One is visualize your work so that you can see what you're doing, because most of the time our work is invisible. And then to only do as much work as you can handle. So visualize your work and limit your work in process. So we did that with them. And we did a few other things. We, we suggested to them perhaps that maybe all of their work wasn't individual tickets and that maybe working as 24 people in a room really wasn't a team. So um, we, we were kind of hands off, uh, kind of reprimandy, but hands off. <laughs> so we said, you know, rather than being a team of 24 people, you might want to experiment with having teams, uh, like have three or four teams. So they did, they set up three teams here, which you can see the blue team, the green team, and the red team, uh, and then, Without really our prompting, they developed two new roles. And their first role was called a ticket slayer. And the ticket slayer would handle any ticket that took between like five minutes and 15 minutes. And then they had another person that was called a smooth operator. And the smooth operator would do triage and do any tickets that could be done basically in the time of a normal phone call. And then anything that didn't fall in those areas went to other people. And the ticket slayers would rotate in and out of the task because it was such fast processing that it would burn people out. Um, almost immediately, they started chipping away at that backlog. And within a month, they'd gotten it from 2000 to about 1750, which still leaves a big mountain, but you can see you know, the divot that, that was put into it. And so they were using one of our personal Kanbans, or they're using personal Kanbans, and they started doing so much work that we showed up one time and they met us at the door and they're like, we have to see you in the conference room. And you know, these are big, you know, cage fighters telling us this and we're like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Um, so we go in and they're like, we're not gonna do personal combat anymore, so we're done. I was like, done with what? <laughs> and so they said, well, we're done. And I um, uh, said, no, we'll find out a different way because I want you to visualize your work but you don't have to use a personal Kanban. And they're like, but you're the personal Kanban people. No, we're the visualize your work people. So we'll figure out a different way. So I said, okay, well, you know, we'll come around, we'll, we'll go to the meetings. You know, you can see the stand-up meetings for these groups, and then you can come to our Deming meeting. And we're like, you're what? And are like, yeah, every day after these three groups meet, we have a representative from each of those groups come and they meet with uh, management, and we talk about the continuous improvement stuff that we did the day before and what our results were. It's like, you did what? Like, you guys that didn't graduate from high school? We're, you, I, holy crap. Uh, so we were completely blown away. And over the next six or seven months, these people went nuts. Getting rid of, not only getting rid of their problem, but finding other problems and getting rid of them. So they, they redesigned their working space. Um, one of the reasons they were kicking holes in the walls was because at one point they had a manager that always wanted to see what everybody was doing. So that manager literally built a big platform in the middle of the room so that he could see every, and mind you, the only thing these people did was this. You know, you couldn't see anything. Maybe you could see that they were on Facebook, but they did this before there was Facebook. So like the first thing they did was they came in and like took axes and <laughs> completely removed the, the, the thing from the middle of the room. So, uh, so these guys are flying along and they're doing this. And this is part of, we put up two big 60 inch monitors after they stopped using the Kanbans. And we said, okay, we're gonna give you real time data. And then when you see things change, 
that can change your, your um, tactics on how you're dealing with tickets as they're coming in. So um, below here, what you can't see is there was like a ticker that was saying time to first touch, time to completion, time, you know, uh, satisfactory resolution, tickets uh, not yet resolved, things like that. Um, but then one day I was on the phone with their CTO and I said, hey, Jabe, um, I noticed in the database that there's a bunch of really old tickets that no one's touched yet. Can you really quickly put a ticket aging summary up on the board so that I can see it? Because this is just a website, right? So I can see it from Seattle. And uh, so he puts this board up. And it's ugly, right? So it's like age. You know, th this is actually after it was up for a few minutes, but initially it was the oldest one up here was 64 weeks. <laughs> you know, so there's like really old tickets up there. And so what was happening was those guys were all sitting at their desks and they're working away, talking to people, and they're working away. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, without any warning from anybody, this thing pops up. And so I said to Jay, how do you think we can you know, incentivize them? Because we all fall into the same traps, right? How do you think we can incentivize these people to deal with these? And one of them disappears. I said, did you see that? And he says, yeah, I, and then another one disappeared. So basically, they're sitting there working at their desks. They're confronted visually with this information. And they're like, that's ugly. That offends me as a professional. I gotta make that whole screen go away. And so they did, they, they jumped on it immediately and just started nuking the whole, the whole thing. And so what I like about this quote down here is that when you get down to the bottom here where it says one must understand the work so that you know, he, uh, you know, oops. That's a powerful button. Um, <laughs> Uh, one must understand the works that he, uh, that he and his people are responsible for, and his people is the key thing. So Jabe theoretically was responsible for that work, but n when everybody took responsibility for it, they, they leaped right on it, right? So they went from just being workers to actually being mindful of the state of the work that was confronting them. And once they achieved that level of mindfulness, no one need to tell them what to do whatsoever. You just needed to give them the information they needed to do a good job. So that's story one. And we'll give it a moment of silence here. So they are, Library Corporation is a theoretically small to medium sized business in the middle of nowhere. So I thought I would follow that up with another small to medium sized business in the middle of nowhere and that's Starbucks. Um, and Starbucks had a problem in that Starbucks was, um, there was, there had always been very harmonious relationships between what they called the partners and management. And partners was everybody that wasn't management. <laughs> um, uh, words are powerful things. And uh, there was this growing tension. And what would happen is you would have a manager in a store and the manager would have a little desk and everybody in the store would be working like crazy and every so often they'd be looking over and the manager would be doing something but no one knew what it was. And they'd be like, you know, it's a Starbucks. What could they possibly be doing back there all day? I hate my manager, you know. So, you know, you got a little fervor under the foam here where the, the, the beautiful outside environment of the, of the Starbucks was a little, little less than desired. So they put up, started putting up personal Kanbans for the uh, managers, initially just for the managers, and saying this is what the managers are doing. And, um, and it was there so that the, ma theoretically it was there just so the managers could manage their own work. But now all of a sudden the whole store knew all the time what the manager was actually working on. And then they would do things like this. They'd be like, oh, um, I've got a couple minutes. I can do this for you. And the store started to take workload off of the manager, which suddenly allowed the manager to do things like stand up <laughs> and do other things and uh, you know, see the store more often and pay more attention to stuff. And so th all this changed the relationships within the store dramatically, or dramatically, not traumatically. <laughs> and then somebody said, well, why don't we put these up for actually the day-to-day -day activities within the stores? And then when they did that, all of a sudden, people suddenly said, 
Why were we so busy? It's like I have nothing to do now because we already did everything on the Kanban, but while there was no Kanban, they felt like they were always under the gun. And it would always be something like this. Manager would sit off in the corner and do nothing. You'd be working crazy through a rush. You'd just finish the rush. you go, <sighs> and then the manager would come out and say, why aren't there any straws? And you'd be like, dude, pay attention. <laughs> so now the board told people when the straws had been done or hadn't done, and the manager had had enough burden relieved from them that they were able to look up every so often and say, oh, I see, there is a rush. Perhaps people might need a bit of a break at the end. Um, and that, of course, led to cognitive ease for everyone. And as we said in the beginning, happy people create better work. So cognitive ease turned into operational ease. Um, so right now, this stuff is working quite well throughout the California uh, instances of Starbucks and uh, getting ready to roll that out through the other five or six stores that, that they have. Um, okay, so the last little story here. Um, yes, this is Mysterious Company X. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel comfortable given some of the things I'm about to say, saying exactly who Mysterious Company X is. So, um, but this is a company, they've got offices all over the world, they're a, um, the parent company is kind of like an acquisition junkie, they've got like a big pocket of money and every so often they just, you know, walk through the Walmart of businesses and pick people up. And um, the people that we were working with did really good work and they were uh, building embedded systems that went into uh, fleet vehicles. And they had sold many of these systems uh, over the years to people who had fleets of anywhere from five to 500 trucks. And then one day, they got a new client. And that new client had uh, about 75,000 trucks. So um, the developers for years had known that there were issues with the software that they had written. And they had begged management, please let us fix these issues. And those issues weren't noticeable with a couple hundred trucks, but were unbelievably noticeable when you got to some very large numbers. You're just like, that number is completely wrong. So the um, software developers that I did get a picture of here uh, were incredibly angry. And uh, they, were, they were rebellious. And so when we arrived, uh, um, Management had decided that they wanted to bring us in, but they asked the developers to actually call. And uh, so when the developers called us, they basically said, you need to come in and fix management because management is completely insane here. And then of course, then we get the email the next day from the management saying, you know, our developers are completely insane. You've got to come in and protect us from them. So it was like, you know, we got, we all got our, 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 our light blue helmets <laughs> and, our light, and our Kevlar jackets and stuff. And we went in as a peacekeeping force to uh, try and uh, bring bring peace between the, the two factions here. So they were upset because they had been telling management for years, this stuff is there. And in software, they call this technical debt. And technical debt is an honest investment that you make, You because you can't write bug-free software. Um, it's, you just, you can't. You can't create perfect software. So you, look at the software that you're about to release and you make a value judgment, you know, can this withstand contact with the public, yes or no, and then you decide to fix what you can fix, and if you're Microsoft, you just release it anyway. Um, so, So in this instance, the message that we had to deliver was that not only management manages things. So uh, these guys and management one day, we were sitting in a meeting and they went completely ballistic on each other. And it's a big room, big long room, so I'm, I'm at like one end of the table and then, you know, it's the, the delegation from the development staff and the delegation from the management staff. And they're, they're you know, uh, going, you know, full on shoe banging on the table. You know, we will destroy you. You know, 
uh, you know, <laughs> Cold War kind of activity, and uh, yelling and yelling and screaming and screaming, and I get a text message from the other end of the table <laughs> from, from Tony Ann saying, are you gonna stop this? And I text back, hell no, this is, this is awesome. I say, I, you, can't, you can't pay for this kind of entertainment. And, and they're just, they're completely going unhinged. And um, I, since then I've watched some meetings of Deming and I was uh, somewhat humbled and pleased to see him at one point do the same thing to GM. But I'm sitting there in, my, in the chair at the end of the table and I'm just like this. And I'm waiting, you know, it's all theatrics. I'm waiting for them to notice me. And then finally somebody says, maybe we should ask what, what, what Jim thinks. <laughs> and so what I told them was, I said, you know, um, I said, you developers have to recognize that management is there to make hard business decisions. And incurring this technical debt, even though it's been incredibly painful because you've had to fix these things under duress because this very large client is now incredibly enraged with you, that to them was a, um, an acceptable risk. Now, management, what you need to understand is that you're looking at business risk and management risk and you're not looking at engineering and technical risk. And on the other side of this table sits your brain trust for what that is. You release a lot of things with a lot of, a lot of bugs, but this particular thing they had a strong reaction to. And when you don't pay attention to them, then you don't value their, their professionalism that makes them angry and sad and it hurts their feelings and it makes them A, unwilling to work for you and B, really, really angry when this work comes back to bite them when they were going to do something that was more interesting. So the, this word, this management word is something that we fight with a lot. So we try and replace it with words like leadership or stewardship or blah, blah, blah ship, um, management ship. Uh, but what happens is that when we get into systems where we're continuously learning and we're continuously improving, the blurry, the lines between various roles begin to blur. When those lines begin to blur, we're like, oh, that's so awesome, we're putting in a Deming-esque world. But what we're actually doing is we're putting people into a highly destabilized political and social environment that is hard to maintain. So we need, when we build our systems, to not just say we're a flat organization or we're a holacracy or whatever buzzword we might have at the time. We need to say, look, we are going to build a system here that is going to support learning and feedback. And we might actually build something too. But if the system itself doesn't, and it doesn't recognize that everybody is in charge of managing that system, and that everybody is going to come back with different kinds of risk profiles to talk about things, then we're going to find ourselves with these Muppets and not this Muppet, right? So last bit here is good teams require diverse voices. Um, so it is so difficult for me to talk without a whiteboard and a pen. Right now, I want to doodle stuff for you guys. Um, when we have decisions that need to be made, uh, what we did with this team and what we've done with other teams, we get them together, we lay out the thing that needs to be built, and then we build a coherent company-wide risk profile. And we don't say that by saying, how much money do you think this is made, or how much money do you think this might lose, or what's the percentage chance you think this might explode and kill half of New Jersey? Um, we say things like, does that scare you? And so what we'll do is we'll get together people throughout the company, um, financial people, management-y people, uh, frontline people, uh, and all of the permutations in between, sales, marketing, and we will give them cards that have the features that are on the thing that's about to be built. And this is whether this is a hard uh, piece of hardware or a piece of software.
or anything in between, it doesn't matter, but what the features are that need to be built. And rather than asking them to go through and do an estimate, which is a fool's errand, what we'll do is we'll give them stickers. These are stupid looking stickers and one of them has a poodle, one of the sticker has a crocodile, and the other set of stickers has a zombie. And we say, okay, poodle, crocodile, or zombie, how much does this feature scare you? And then everybody puts them on the cards. And then we flip the cards over. And then we say, aha, poodle, 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 zombie. Woo! <laughs> Didn't see that coming. So, you know, especially if that's marketing or that's finance, those are the people who are never involved. <laughs> um, you can go all the way through and build the most perfect thing and in the end not be able to sell it to somebody because you didn't recognize that it had you know, some sort of risk that they, in their professional judgment, would have recognized. Um, this is something that we come back to all the time. Uh, psychologically, it's very difficult for us as people to develop numbers that actually have meaning. We're really bad at it because we fall into line with something called uh, experimenter's bias which means we set up the experiment to prove what we want to prove. Um, or there are other biases that say we will interpret any information that we get as we would like to interpret that information. So um, one, of my, one of my favorite instances of that was at Stanford, they got together, there's like a room here and like a room over here. In this room they put all pro-choice people. In that room they put all pro-life people and they gave them the exact same data. And then they said, okay, what's this data show? <laughs> and both, both of them came out and said, shows we're awesome, you know? So, uh, <laughs> um, so when we set up numeric metrics, we will fool ourselves all the time. All the time. No matter how scientific or awesome we think we are. We are so filled with goodwill and hope and desire and a, and, a, and a push to see our worldview get through that we will always mess ourselves up that way. So, but what we rarely lie about to ourselves is, is how we feel. So that very thing that we've been trying to boil out of business for 150 years is exactly what Tony Ann and I are trying to stick in, not for some new agey happy reason, but because that's actually the only metric that people will self-report on in an honest way. You know, now granted, if the organization is filled with fear, then people are like, I'm happy, I'm really happy. Oh, it's a good day, really. I like my, I like my, can I go now? Um, when you bring a bunch of different people into a room and you give them something disarming, crazy stickers or ask them to draw happy faces and smiley faces, or frowny faces, um, they will actually betray the diversity of their own thought. And if you build the system so that, it's al that it allows them to do that, then they'll, they'll do it without reservation. You know, the first time they'll have maybe a little bit of reservation, but after that they'll just go. So um, the first day of doing Lean Coffee at Comcast was pretty much like doing you know, lean coffee, uh, you know, in Iraq. You know, it was like, uh, yes, Mr. Hussein, uh, this is exactly what I think right now. Thank you so much. Uh, but over the course of the week, it was interesting to watch how that, uh, how that fell away. Because the system of the lean coffee rewarded a certain behavior. Uh, and we didn't have to tell people to actually necessarily do anything. Um, uh, if you want to, I could have done that case study here, and that would have had some really angry Muppets. <laughs> so, um, how am I doing for time? Uh, you're about out of time. I'm about out of time. Good. That's exactly where I want to be. So, uh, so um, in this way, you know, we kind of treat these two things as separate. We kind of see the system together, but the system of profound knowledge actually is joy of work because we are our process. Come back to uh, the guy with the pipe who said, we are part of our process. The guy with the suit uh, says that our emphasis is on why. Uh, the frog says that we have our own stories and as we learn more, we write our own settings for our stories. And I hope you're able to see the, oh, you're not. Okay, so there's a nice picture of Paul Simon behind here too that didn't 
the, the, this stupid screen won't let you see, but uh, this is uh, from uh, Paul Simon's uh, song, Train in the Distance. And the quotes, the lines go, what is the point of this story? Uh, what information pertains? Um, the thought that life could be better is woven indelibly into our hearts and our brains. And this is the nutshell of, of Deming for me, is the rampant, nasty practicality of humanism. <laughs> that when we inject uh, tolerance and respect for actual human beings into the process, they do all the other work for us. Control charts, Six Sigma, this is and that's. Um, all of those are just tools that are on top of good people trying to do good work, which is what they do naturally. So uh, that's me, and that's my talk, and now I'm out of time.